Alex, it's great to see you again. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Well, I'm overjoyed that you've allowed us into your driver room. This is like your prep area. I Don't guess. worry, I didn't allow you. <laughs> Content allowed you. Uh, that's um, No, of course you're welcome here. This is basically not as glamorous as I think you would expect. Uh, I don't know what, what, what you had in mind. It's smaller. Smaller, smaller, true. And normally, what well, sometimes depends, depends how much time the team have before races. For example, we only have a week here, but sometimes I'll carpet it, make it feel a bit more homely. Sometimes we'll have a sofa, but we are on stalls. Um, so yes, obviously my lovely, yeah, lovely five, suits. Five sets of overalls. Is that one for each on-track session? That sounds like I'm a diva, but trust me, there are drivers that have a new suit a session. So um, we're not one of them. Problem is, we obviously have a white suit, so and the listeners can't see this, but um, shows the dirt. Weirdly, my bum has remained pretty clean. Normally, you get dirty marks around your well, your posterior. Well, it depends how many fast corners there are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so come back after the F1, you're going to see a bit. <laughs> but um, but it is quite bad, and uh, white suits aren't that smart. But they look good, so that's fine. Three helmets behind you. How many helmets yeah. do you get through in a season? We're all contracted, so um, we all have different deals with helmet suppliers. Generally speaking, there's a number they have in mind. It's, it's, it's I don't know, maybe I'm low. <laughs> I, bet, I bet you I'm lower than Lewis. But I have about 16, 17 helmets a year. Um, I rarely even use that many. It's hard to use that many helmets. You don't really need it as well, because actually it's nicer to use use helmets because they, they soften up a little bit around your your cheeks and your head so it feels more comfortable like a, like a pair of jeans um but otherwise yes i have 16 sometimes i go more depends how adventurous i am with um one-off designs and and all that kind of thing but we tend to have three you need three on rotation every every week well that's great intel and it and it's really is good to see you and i was wondering whether you might have developed an american accent over the winter <laughs> Because I spent so much, so much time. time in the US. Yes, yeah, I do. I, I like it there. It's um, my girlfriend's from from LA, so it's a little bit easier. And it, it makes more sense to go over there, um, especially when Europe and the UK, more than anything, is um, exceptionally hot. So we end up uh, hot, cold. Sorry, cold. <laughs> I'm getting confused. Um, so it's nice to go out to LA. Um, you know, cent- city LA is is a bit. Mm, I, I'm not a big fan, but but. The Where suburbs, do you hang out then? Um, more towards um, the north side, so Calabasas. Um, it's called Westlake. People know that area, um, but in the mountains, more towards Malibu area. So it's some um, beautiful, amazing um, cycling roads and um, amazing facilities, running tracks. In America, the sports is so well done. Um, you know, you speak to the high schools or the colleges, and they they give you some privileges. So it's it's very nice. And did you get any downtime? Um, I mean, that is kind of downtime. It, it sounds weird to say, but when we are in the middle of training camp, that's the time away from, from racing. We're kind of um, doing our own thing, have our routine. Um, my girlfriend, she plays golf. Um, so and we're kind golf. of... We saw you in the Netflix Cup last year. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was um, the day before the Netflix Cup, I had to practice... Um, Obviously, so my girlfriend um, is my girlfriend's coach is actually based in 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 Las Vegas, so it was perfect. So I, I did a session with him. We went to a really nice course. It's called Shadow Creek. It's like a very um, posh, uh, very exclusive course, and I couldn't hit the ball. Literally missed every single and this shot. This is the day before. This is the day before. I couldn't. I it, I was shanking it. You know, I was just thinking in my head, okay, we, there's going to be a crowd behind us, around us. I am going to kill someone. Um, <laughs> luckily, you're um, overthinking it. Is what you're doing. I was overthinking it, and um, the coach said, "Don't worry, um, your clubs are a bit short. We'll get you some better clubs, and you'll be fine tomorrow." Um, I didn't believe him because why would you? Did, 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 I mean, you know, it doesn't really um, help, but it did. Or maybe it was just that I needed that little bit more confidence. Um, that was the best I played for a long time and I was glad to be able to do it in front of camera in front of my girlfriend of course um, and in front of the professionals because uh, you know the first hole it was a um, a scramble so you take the best ball I hit my ball closer than the the pros it was a par three um, 
that's that's my takeaway that's my uh, claim to fame uh, that was before you fell over yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry i didn't want <laughs> you you got me yeah yeah, yes. yeah. i wasn't gonna mention it but okay fine <laughs> let's go in it's a weird um, sport golf the, it is the more i play the worse i get that's interesting Explain i that to i me. i have the same kind of thing when i take a long break my first game back i think it's because you don't overthink it once you start to try to yeah. pick up habits, you're trying to remember why you played well that one day. Yeah. And then you're trying to, you know, you're in that vicious circle. Um, I actually think, r- r- real talk now, golf is very good to teach you mentally how to approach many things in life. I think it's a great lesson because it's so easy to get over frustrated in golf. It's so easy to think too much. It's so easy. Um, it sounds quite like Formula One, really. It way. is. Exactly. Exactly that. It has good life lessons and it's... Um, I think th- as I've started playing golf, I've definitely learned to not be as wound up about playing badly and things like that. I always just play golf now to have a good time, which makes a big difference. But um, in the beginning, you're too competitive. I did also see that you've been um, charging around in Singer 911 Porsches. I have. I have. I wish it was mine. It's not, it wasn't it is not mine. I was going to say... People what? thought it was mine. People thought I had two. And I said, with all due respect... Um, I would ne- go, need to negotiate a little bit more with James Lowes <laughs> to well, be able to afford two. Alex, <laughs> Never for people who don't know, yeah. the Singer 911s are vintage Porsches. Vintage Porsches. They're called Resto Mods. That's the official term. Backed up beautifully. And they, they're now worth up to, what, $2 million? Yes, you can. So actually, um, a shameless Williams plug, but Williams, there's a special edition of the Singer. So they have, a, um, they have one built in America. It's, um, it takes, I don't know how long it takes, a year and a half, two years to, for them to build them. Most likely completely wrong in what I'm saying, but they are around a million. And then they have this thing called the DLS, which is a... Uh, is that the lightweight? It's a lightweight edition. Yeah, you, you know, you yeah. know, you know a bit. Um, Williams did their engines. So the Williams, um, they did a collaboration and, and the engine is very good. So Williams, the WA, WAE, Williams Advanced Engineering, which was... Um, very much involved in that project and them cars are built in the UK um, and them ones they can go over 3 million um, so uh, what are they like my, to drive <laughs> so that's why I don't have yes. one <laughs> very what are they like to drive are they like um, do you feel like you're driving something from that, that's old or are they, are they no 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 really so tight I would say I drove I drove the, the original um through the to the kind of canyon roads around LA, um, very raw. So you get this feeling like you have this loud engine in the behind you. You have um, very, you feel very connected to the road. Um, then on the DLS, that's that's a different ball game. That is really special. It has double wishbone suspension. Again, don't quote me on this. I could be totally wrong. Um, but the way it rides curbs, I drove it on a track um, in in it's called Thermal, which is near LA. It's like a it's a Imagine a golf course, exclusive golf course, but instead of a golf course, it's a racing track. So you pay a membership fee to have a house uh, on the property. And then once you pay that membership fee, you have unlimited, you have a track. Laps. You have your, a track. Your own private You have track. your own private track. Wow. Um, so how, how did you get on it? Um, <laughs> the guy who owned the DLS, so not mine. Has a membership. Has, oh. has a membership. He has a house there and um, we were just driving around. It was for charity. So... Um, I, some 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 very kind gentleman donated some money for me to take him around and and so that and how important was it for you to get some downtime at the end of a, a long and intense formula one season i remember you being quite ill in abu dhabi actually yes i got sick i had a um, throat infection also after after abu dhabi so it, it meant my winter training was coming from quite far down in terms of fitness i really had to work quite hard to get it but did, so did you do nothing after abu um no, so i went straight into a training camp i wanted to start training before christmas because i wanted to i felt so tired and sometimes just doing nothing is not good so you want to get your body moving um i wanted to build a good amount of fitness better than how i finished in abu dhabi just to make sure once i go over christmas and new year which everyone takes off um there was less work to do when i got back um, because we had a weirdly long break, didn't we? We finished Abu Dhabi early December, so you kind of spend a month twiddling your thumbs a bit. So I, so I did a bit of a training camp. You know, I was I was about two two and a half kilos down from from race one, so I lost 
um, over the over the year about two and a half kilos of muscle. That is all muscle. That's all That's muscle. Um, so I had to get that back up. Um, and then your fitness, you know, your cardio, your CO2, your sorry, CO2, your <laughs> cardiovascular system, it, it really does, your VO2 really does start to take a hit just because you can't, can you imagine when we do triple headers, when when we, when we're going in the hotels and, and airports and whatnot, and, and now that marketing here, the marketing stuff, you, you at best get one day of training before you go into your next race and then one day of training and then you go into your next race. So on a Monday or a Tuesday after a race weekend, that's your, your time to train. It's not much. It's not much. But I'm interested this weight loss over the year. Did it affect you in races later on? With all the training you do, you actually arrive, at least for me, maybe some some people are different. I, I arrive at race one as fitter than I than I do for the rest of the year because I've spent all that time to, to just get out there and, and do my training. So... You get race fit, but there's also general fitness. So your your race fitness gets up, so your neck gets stronger, your core gets stronger. Um, but then on the other side, your your general fitness, your your cardio and everything starts to drop, and your muscle mass starts to drop. So you you start to lose in other areas. And I think the jet lag is actually a huge one, which people possibly don't consider as well. All right, this is an interesting topic, given where we're going next week. Yes. How are you going to combat? Where are we jet going next week? In Australia. Australia. <laughs> um. <laughs> I leave on Saturday, so right. so, so that gets so you in Sunday, does it? Gets me in Sunday. So if I, my plan right now is, I will fly back from as we are in Jeddah, Sunday night. Um, Monday is um, trip to the dentist in in uh, in London, and then Tuesday, Wednesday will be sim. Uh, Thursday we have a marketing day with with golf, one of our sponsors, and then um, Friday a tr- once a session with with my trainer, and then fly Saturday. Um, get and get ready then for when the you week. Hit the ground in Australia. Yeah. How do you combat the jet lag? So we do it before. We even do it before we start flying out. So so as we start to move around, um, we start doing our normal things. But you know, um, lights a big thing. So blocking light, shades. Um, I'm not so big on melatonin. I don't really like the sleeping stuff. It feels unnatural to me. So I use cherry extract. It's like a natural sedative. So that worked pretty well. Um, and will you take that just before bedtime? Before before bedtime, try and get earlier. I don't actually know Australia yet, but my my trainer, we have a sleep doctor, and they basically give us tell us what to do, how you eat, very important, how you sleep and hydrate, and ex- as I said, exposure to light, caffeine. So the way you take coffee or I, I use coffee, um, it all plays a big part. And how does it affect you in the car? Um, I think the main thing is is. You could imagine what we're doing already requires a lot of concentration and, and your your reflexes, the coordination with your engineer speaking to you on the radio, um, especially when we go to these street tracks. So Melbourne's going to be one of them. And you just don't feel like you're optimal. You don't, you know, you, you can tell that you're not as sharp as you want to be. And that's the and worst thing. is that feeling. reflected in the stopwatch or not? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I imagine it is. I imagine it is. And, and so there is a huge effort. And I think one of the biggest things I've, realized as i've spent time in formula one is really putting yourself first really taking care of yourself i think as the as the uh the schedule gets busier and busier especially the way that we treat our bodies and treat our time has been so important so and you know really prioritizing your sleep the training um which of course you know we're formula one drivers we're we're supposed to do all these events and 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 do what you simulate work and whatever so it, it is a balance um being good at that management is it takes up most of my days when i'm not driving the car trying to be as um as organized as possible well it's been two years since you were last on the pod and i was going to say what is the biggest lesson you've learned in that time have you have you just revealed it um self-care for sure is one of them um and generally speaking it it's more just being about confidence and and two years is is two years of life maturing so you know speaking with the team and understanding how to lead a team and how to develop a team and try and get the car into a better place that's been most of the work I've done since our, our last podcast I think when when I spoke to you last a lot of it's just trying to survive trying to get another contract trying to to get an extension or whatever it was back then um now it's more in a position where I feel comfortable you're never truly comfortable but um more about 
being that team player more than more than having to be selfish to to fight for for my career yeah we all know that teamwork is a huge part of formula 1 but it's also the key to success in most industries and workplaces so if you're on the hunt for the perfect addition to your team let indeed do the hard work for you with over 350 million global monthly visitors Indeed is not just a job search website, it's your ultimate hiring partner. Its powerful matching engine ensures you find top quality candidates quickly, so you can get back to what matters most, growing your business. I've known people that have been in the same position as you, and I've seen how overwhelming the hiring process can be. And I can't help but think that if they'd known about Indeed back then, it would have saved so much time and energy. So say goodbye to the endless work of scheduling interviews, screening resumes, and managing communication. Indeed streamlines the entire hiring process for you, allowing you to connect with potential hires faster than ever before. 93% of employers agree that Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. And don't just take my word for it, experience the difference for yourself. With over 140 million qualifications and preferences analysed daily, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning and evolving to meet your specific hiring needs. The more you use Indeed, the better it gets at finding the perfect fit for your team. So join the ranks of over 3.5 million businesses worldwide who trust Indeed to help them hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash grid. Just go to Indeed.com slash grid right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash grid. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Laurel Mekies was on the pod last week and he said drivers can get quicker every year. Whereas I'd always had the belief that the the speed isn't what changes. It's maybe your racecraft and your yeah. all the things wrapped around it. But he actually believes you can get faster. Do you? I, I agree. I, I definitely think that's the case. I think there is a there, it's kind of the same thing, but it's not. Um, your speed becomes, at least for me, what I've found is my speed becomes quicker because I know more and more what I want in the car and I know how to get it. So I know how to set up a car. I know how to get the car into a good window. I know how to the tires in qualifying or in the race are going a certain direction not good let's say i know how generally i know how to fix it i know what areas i need to improve on so it, the experience really brings t- together a an, an overall understanding of what you need what suits your driving style but also um what are the limits of the car some some bits you can't fix some bits you have to just ignore and focus on some other areas of the car you know there might be a, a, a characteristical issue in the car that you could spend all day working on it, fix it, but you've made 10 other things worse. So this kind of appreciation for 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 getting lap time out of the car um, and understanding of it has really gone a long way for me. Um, and I think that's that's one of the biggest things I've learned. And, and you mentioned leading the team. That's something that James Val said when he was on the pod as well, that he, he wants to build Williams around you. Mm. And have you felt that? I have. I would definitely say I'm far more involved now than I than I was before. But in decisions beyond how to make the car go faster in qualifying, I mean, in terms of structural decisions within the team, things it like is, that. It is, but it's not. You know, I'm not there saying we need to do this or this because that's James's job, and I think James sees it much clearer than I do. And his experience at Mercedes and whatnot has really helped him um, know what we need. And for me, it's more. I've seen these areas and. I don't there's no kind of stone that has been left untouched that I didn't think need fixing and James has already turned it over mm-hmm. that makes sense so so I feel like we've you know in terms of an understanding of what the team needs to do to to be a better you know top field team we know we know it's it's it is, there's there's not this discussion of where do, where is it what are we looking for we know what it is but it it will take time but how hard is it to get that it's hard. It is hard, and I think I, mean, I don't want to speak for James, but I think the you know every year that goes on, especially when we're coming into this year, you see um, we've talked a lot about our car, how we've 
really changed the philosophy and the DNA of the car and we've really gone about it a different way. Um, there are some things we have improved massively to last year, um, but it has definitely stretched the team. It's really pushed it to its limits and um, the cracks show in areas and, and it's interesting to see how, um, you know, especially for James, it's, it's oh, myself as well, just because because I want the team to be better and 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 we want to be fighting, but um, them areas are where we need to to improve because we we've got a good foundation now. It's just it's going to take time. It, it really is to 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 be one of them teams fighting for the podiums. But you know, you have raced for a top team in Red Bull. Yeah. What are the fundamental differences? It's a well-oiled machine, Red Bull. I think there aren't any real weak points. I mean, even my, my time at at Red Bull. When is that now? Four years ago, five years ago, um, it was still a well-oiled machine, and they've only just made steps from then. Um, and it's, I don't know. You know, when I spent when I had my time at Red Bull, you can just see that everyone's doing their job. Everyone's at the very top of their game. And um, Williams, we do some things very well. Some things we need to improve on. You know, it's not as um, refined, but it's still in its growing phase. Um, and I think that's that's really the biggest difference. The 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 desire and the passion that's clearly there, and that's always been there at Williams. And do you feel what are you? You're 27 now. 27, got, yeah, getting old. Got... <laughs> Almost 28. <laughs> yes, it's end of March. Isn't this it? might come out when I'm 28. <laughs> and what 80 old Grand Prix under your belt? Do you feel yeah. you're hitting your peak now? It's weird because I saw a statistic the other day, and I thought I must have been one of the more experienced drivers or midfield. But actually, you take away Logan, Joe, and um, Oscar. I'm going to miss some, someone else. I think I'm joint with Yuki, but I'm like I'm joint fourth least experienced driver, which is weird to say as a statistic. But I, I feel much more than that. And and as you said, when when um, when you take into account four years of experience, um, I still think like what you said about Laurent. I think. There's always more to come. I don't think it just stops now. You still explore, you still find things with your driving or with, with things or let's say set up ideas and philosophies that you figure out. There's still more to come. There's always do, one to Do you think that if, I mean, you outqualified Logan at every race last year, if you were under more pressure from your teammate, do you think your rate of improvement would be faster? Um, it's a tricky question. Um, I think different drivers respond very differently. So I think um, some drivers need that kind of um, prod. Other drivers actually are the totally opposite. If they can be in a happy space, they that's where they perform the best. For me, it's somewhere in the middle. I, I think um, what I've learned is I, I the more I can just focus and be in the present and not worry about the other side and, and that kind of thing, that's where, how I perform the best. But at the same time, um, I love that. I love that kind of that fight. I enjoy the I enjoy the competition. So, so yeah, it is. It is it's somewhere in between. It's somewhere in between. But um, it, it did does, you yeah. learn more when you had Max Verstappen and Danny Kvyat next to you than you do having Logan Sargent next to you? Uh, <laughs> again, tough question. <laughs> I would say, of course, yes, because I was also so inexperienced to start with. So. Mm. The rate of learning and what I had to learn and what there was to learn was so much more when I started Formula One than than what it is now. There's there's still things I'm learning, of course, but but it was such an an open world, an unexplored world um, back when I first was in Formula One. So so in that sense, yes. Um, but yeah, I, I would say my my roles have changed though. So so more than anything, if you take teammates aside, it's more you know I'm 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 enjoying with this new car, for example, exploring different setups, doing different things. Um, you know, I think especially right now, the dynamic within the team, um, we're just pushing the envelope and, and uh, because I have the experience and, and I think also confidence to just try things during a weekend and of course, always come back if it doesn't work out. But um, that side has changed. Whereas I think when I was more, you know, up against Max and Danny, it was more just about just give me a car, give me the car that, that the other guy's driving and I'll and I'll get up to speed and I need to figure it out with my driving and, and my tools, you know, what we're doing on the steering wheel. 
where to improve and and now that's you know i guess in some ways that bit i know i can do it so 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 i there's much more time spent exploring You're, i feel that the alex i'm talking to now would have dealt with that part of your formula one career so differently yeah if it were to sure. happen now it is but that's hindsight i think hindsight, hindsight is beautiful. And experience it and is and you wouldn't i wouldn't be where i am now if i didn't go through that in time so it would always you know always goes back but i do think you know maybe people forget that i only spent six months in toro so before i got to the big team and and there was still quite a big gap in my maturity and and understanding of f1 before i huge it was it was yeah. it was um you know rookies now i think people over time have really got an understanding of of how tough it is to be a rookie i think teams too i think teams give give their drivers more time as well as a result um but on the same kind of negative spiral it's why the teams are also so hesitant to have rookies in, in in their teams so um it is it is a big jump and it's getting a bigger jump now just because these cars i find very they're tricky to drive they're much harder than they were back in 2017 um why where's the lap time in these cars it's the cars are, are stiff they're low and that's where you get the downforce the cars move around much more um every bump you feel um you have to have true confidence in the cars now because when you're when they are jumping around in the middle of a corner um More and like karting exactly exactly actually um it feels like it's it's definitely taken a step back in terms of um refinement and it actually starts to feel you know you've got to you've got to wrestle these things so so that side of things has played a much bigger part in i think getting lap time out of out of the cars and, and as a consequence they're much easier to make mistakes i think you know when you run a stiff car and it's it's edgy and and these cars they're still very wind dependent the normal kind of things it, it adds another layer to make it more difficult to drive well what about the fw46 talking about it being wind dependent that was yeah yeah, was Somewhat, big... something that the, the team's cars have suffered from quite a lot in recent years. Yes, isn't it? yes. Is it still an issue? It's interesting. So, um, Bahrain was a was a, always a bad track for us um, because it's windy. Because it's windy, yeah. and and the corners don't suit us. And um, what we found last week was just how much better the car is at certain wind angles. So. I always find wind is more of a balance amplifier. So let's say you have a, a corner where you have front locking or understeer. That wind will only make it worse. And for the same reason, if you have a bit of oversteer here and there, that wind's only going to make it worse. So you only, you're only you just pulling the car apart. It kind of really highlights issues in the car. Um, and the 45 had a lot of issues. Um, when the wind was behind us, it was... A nightmare and, and we've seen massive steps for for this year the only thing i would say to that is um everyone's mid step so so that that midfield is quite frustrating because i mean the top teams have made a step the bot the mid bottom midfield teams have made an even bigger step but they've all made the same step so um so yeah. the gaps between teams feel quite similar yeah exactly and, and it's all relative so we're yeah. We kind of improved, you know, six, seven, eight tenths to last year. Massive yeah. jumps and race pace, even more massive steps. You look around your shoulder and it's the same people you're fighting yeah. for the same positions. So, so um, when you so, qualify, yeah. what was it, 13th? Yes. You know, was it a good lap? Were you thinking that that, that is our true position? It is. Our true position? I, I was happy with the lap. I think there's always, call it race one rust. There's a little bit you can find, but I think that's, uh, it'd be unfair to say every driver drove a perfect lap. I think there's always a bit from everyone. Um, but you know, what was it? Q one was 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 it eight tenths or a sec or just over a second covering the whole the whole field? Mm. Um, now it's more like you make a little mistake and you think that's two positions. But but it actually, it's good for the drivers because there's it is. even more emphasis on you guys. It is it is to um, not make mistakes and and the good good guys will shine. And that's 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 where everyone's going. I think that's mm. it, it's in some ways it's a bit of a shame to see comments about max and it being a boring season because it's totally not that at least p from my perspective because you take take him out of the equation you have one of the the best grids the best field the mm. tightest grids ever in formula one and even if even if you include max it's still the tightest mm. field in formula one so and let's not that, forget that Charles Leclerc actually did the fastest qualifying exactly, lap last exactly weekend. exactly and um in q2 i i, I 
it's hard because it's 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 the leader so everyone focuses on the leader but but the the racing at the back is it's so intense um we pitted two laps too late in um in bahrain during the race and we lost six positions so we went from from 11th and finished 15th so it, it's time but what about the development of this car do you feel there's more scope than there was last year there is there is so in our heads without exposing too much um we've got a very good platform we know where the lap time is some of it is achievable some of it isn't um more for next year which obviously is a bit painful to say because it's far away but that's just the way it is um we have a good foundation as i said and um we've got some updates coming but i'll, I'll say it again in the end everyone does so you're only you're only trying to out out perform um and overachieve compared to the others so we've we know we've got that time hiding in the car um let's see what the others have have you enjoyed bouncing ideas off pat fry yeah he's been great i really enjoyed pat um we have these meetings um monday after every race and uh just kind of like a shoot your shit uh <laughs> Everyone kind of has a bit of a, a chat around the areas we need to focus on and whatever. Um, and obviously Pat has so much experience and it's mm. very interesting to see the areas we need to work in as a team because he's coming from also a very um, organizational background. So when he talks, he's not just talking, he's not technically always talking about performance, but he's just talking about how can we be more efficient as a team and, and focusing on the areas where, where I think as when we look at the areas up for us to improve that that's really our main 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 areas so um yeah you know some things he will say are positive and and there are others which he says we need work to, to do um but it's good yeah so two podiums to your name already yes long, that, long, long too, time ago do you think was. it's well, <laughs> is it too big an ask for 2024 we need something. Well, um, Max and Lewis take each other out, and then Max and Lewis <laughs> take each other out. Charles and Lewis. Oh no! At that, that point, we'll have Charles and Charles and Carlos. Yeah. Um, we'll get a few of them out, and then we can we can so go to podium. It would need exceptional. It would need yeah, something, yeah. but there's always two races, I think, in the year that that happens, and you just yeah. got to be in the right place at the right spot, and and you can have a chance. You know, look at um, Esteban in Hungary, for example. So. There's always a chance. Right, I mean, look at the Alpines last year with Esteban's podium it in is. Monaco or Pierre in Zandvoort, I think it was. It is, it is exactly. Maybe I, I... Actually, we're just talking about those results last year, I mean, what was it? You qualified fourth uh, in Zandvoort. In Zandvoort. Yeah, Did, yeah, there you go. And you we, we, we were genuinely running fourth or fifth for most of the race. We, yeah. we didn't have the greatest. Um, well, we didn't take the gamble like other people did that race with the tires. If you remember, it was raining yeah, yeah. and drying and all these kind of things. We couldn't because we were in such a good position. We thought we've got to just play yeah. it safe. We've got to stay out. Uh, but that's very true. You know, we, we're not far away and it's only going to take a little bit for us to get there. So um, let's hope for a podium. I'm not sure if we'll come, um, but I'll remain optimistic. Yeah, and of course, it's the longest season in the history of Formula One. And... I know a lot of people watching, listening to this, will be going, "What happens to the pets?" Asked <laughs> while you're. Don't away. worry, I have um, four siblings um, and a mum um, who take a lot of care with with the pets. So, don't worry, they are fed more than well. They are definitely living a happy life. <laughs> um, so What's do the not latest worry. count? Because they've got their own Instagram. I always account. forget, but it, I it's believe Albon, it's thirteen cats. Albon underscore. Pets. Albon underscore. Please give them a follow. <laughs> uh, our one underscore pets we got 13 cats and can I stop you two then? horses why, why 13 cats I mean um, I love cats but so there's 13? always this thing and I I don't know if anyone can resonate with this um, let's say we want a cat fine we've already got too many cats at home but whatever there might be a reason for it um, normally the reason is um, you know there's a litter and and they're struggling to sell them or, or you know, they don't know what to do with them. Like, okay, first person they so call All the it. local dealer. Uh, breeders, exactly, not exactly. Dealers. All breeders. <laughs> all first the bre one. <laughs> Alex will have one. Alex, <laughs> will, Alex <laughs> Albon will, will, will take one. So they call out and they say, listen, we've got quite an issue. Um, blah, blah, blah. 
so what often happens is my sisters and, and my mom will go to the you know to place you know either a stray cat or whatever it may be somehow going in to get one when it when they come home there's three or four <laughs> and it's like where have these come from and um that's happened three times and so right. you can imagine we we're supposed to in some ways supposed to only have three and then ended up with 10 because th there was one litter we took four we supposed to come with one and we we took four so there's we got one called um this giraffe hippo um on, can you name all 13 no, cats right. i got i got quizzed this the They're other day and i don't <laughs> the problem is animals. i'm not there enough so i, mm. I really struggled to because obviously a lot of them are brothers and sisters, it's really hard to know which one's which. So yeah. we've got Amani, Gucci, um, Prada, and Lucky. Lucky is just, I don't know why Lucky, but they were kind of a group. And then we have Goose and Duck, that's five, six. Then Hugo for Hugo Boss, that's seven. Um, and then there is a Giraffe, Hippo. Um, oh, God. Lion. No, not Lion. There's two more, which are... I'm gonna get killed for not knowing this. And then there's sushi. Um, then we have a dog called Otty. Um, and then we have two horses. I thought, and there's Stan. Stan. So, st <laughs> if you really want to know, <laughs> each cat has numerous names. Oh, okay. So Amani is called Amani Mumu, um, and Adja. And then someone like Stan. So I call him Stan. Some of my other sisters call him Hugo. Ah. Um, so can you see there's yes, this whole this complex confusing. it is very yeah. confusing um, right. I'm sure the cats have but no idea what nutshell, they're called but in a nutshell it's 13 cats 2 horses and, and a dog and a dog yes so um, and then Stan made some shoes didn't he are you wearing them now I am wearing these are custom one of ones but um, I do have shoes I'm going to have some shoes this year so make sure everyone I see a lot of drivers releasing their merch already hold on to your money <laughs> And spend it on my Actually, Alex, I was impressed the way you got um, Fernando Alonso to yes. wear a pair in Singapore. Fernando has to be one of the best guys ever because um, I didn't... I've told this story before, but I didn't want to, you know, leapfrog and leech on the driver and say, hey, you know, do you want to use... Can you wear my stuff, whatever. I was like, if, they'll, uh, if they want some, sure, of course, I'll give it to them. Um, and so Yuki asked, no problem. Um, and then we were coming out of driver's briefing and Fernando was like, oh, not, I like your shoes. Can you get me one? And I was like, yeah, you, you bet you can. So um, I straight away spoke to my manager. I was like, you got to get Fernando a pair of shoes. Um, we had a pop-up store in Singapore. So he ran down to the pop-up store, got a pair for him, brought them back. And, uh, and you know, he's, he's a, I think he's a Hugo Boss ambassador. You know, he, 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 he does so wear his the Hugo's, team is, I think. Yeah, the team yeah. is, I think he, he looks like he has a personal deal with them, whatever it is. So he does wear Hugo Boss shoes. Um, and then on Sunday for the race weekend, there he is with Alex Alvin Athletics. It so so cool. uh, it was very cool of him and uh, very nice of him. I think he's, um, he's very in with the kids. Like, you know, we're not that young, but, um, you know, with all, especially because he's in Monaco now, a lot of the guys, we get on well with him. And, um, well, there's the paddle yeah, matches. Good. There's the paddle and matches, and uh, he's a good lot. He's I a good lot. Actually, yeah. I was playing paddle on the Sunday after the Bahrain Grand yes. Prix, and he was there as well. I said, Oh, I hear you're <laughs> decent at paddling. Yeah, yeah. He went, Not so much me being good, it's more the other drivers being, <laughs> being I was, not I was, so good. I was speaking to Lando the other day, um, because I think he played with, uh, there was a grouping of them with, with Max and, someone else i can't remember um but uh lando said first 10 minutes he was kind of late got up late and strolled out of bed and uh he teamed up with fernando um, better maybe lando tells the story but basically said he was so serious like the most competitive man you could ever meet um you know he was just that guy like are you in it or not kind of thing um which i just thought is super cool because that yeah. i mean he that you have to he, sharpen up when you're he, with him yeah, right? he, yeah he lives and breathes compet yeah. competition and you see yeah. it you see it in everything he does yeah. well alex it has been brilliant to chat can yes. you just clarify one thing for us yes before you go which is 2025 yes. okay there's going to be so much movement in the driver market yes what's the sitch with you and william <laughs> it's um it's something that we know. Let's say it like that. Um, uh, we're going to have to wait a bit. You're going to have to wait and see. But, um, you know, on my side, 
I'm totally focused on the team. I feel like it, I know it sounds generic, but but it is very true that um, I love being a part of this team. I love the, you know what we spoke about earlier, this kind of building the team around and and this progress that this upwards progress that we're on um, is very exciting. Um, of course, you know, I, I won't deny and say there are opportunities around. You know, there is um, a very fluid driver market right now, and I think um it's exciting it's moving around um but my my focus and my entire time is put on on the team and um i'm here to go racing and then that's it well look, good luck with everything hope that podium comes your way uh new for this year some quick fire questions to end yes very quickly what else are you good at what else am i good at <laughs> oh okay I, I, pets Apart from pets, I, I'm not good at anything else than racing, and even then, it's questionable. But let's say it's not um, questionable. Stop being modest. <laughs> photography. I enjoy photography. Um, I enjoy cooking, but I'm not good at cooking. Um, more like sweet things than than savoury things. Um, I'm not good at golf. Uh, that's it. I'm very limited. Very limited. <laughs> Which racing driver would you want to be stuck in a lift with? Uh, no one who has any bowel issues. <laughs> uh, let's let's have a think. I think it, it depends how long, but I, I wouldn't want someone who's just talking all the time. Just someone quiet. So maybe like a Valtteri. Just keep it quiet. Who would play you in a film? I don't think anyone has a face like mine. You know what I mean? Like I've got quite a not unique face but it's hard to do i always have thought of um jackie chan just because why not you can put a few backflips in it as a who's the coolest person in your address book and i got again boring boring I, i'm i'm not i'm 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 it's my parents my girlfriend and and that's me and of course the racing drivers so i'm, I'm well out of the limelight you know i'm not the guy to go to these uh, fashion events or, or, or concerts. So, um, <laughs> Stan. sorry to all my, all, anyone who knows me, I've, I've, I've dissed all of you because none of you are cool. Uh, Stan, yeah, Stan has his own phone. No, I'm joking, he doesn't, but. And look, final one. Who would be your first guest if oh, you hosted a podcast? That's a good question. Valentino Rossi. Yes, definitely. Nice.